Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Q&A about history of science and technology. Well, I'm happy to try and uh, tell you about things I know, both from my personal experience of uh, the last, I don't know, 50 or so years of, of uh, uh, science and technology, or things that I've studied for other reasons. I see a whole bunch of questions that have been sent in or left over. So let me see what I can address first. There's one from Streamer. What happened with computers during World War II? Well, I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of memory uh, work here and let me make sure I get all the dates right. But let me, let me talk a little bit about this, sort of the overall picture of computers and computer. Um, electronic computers, digital electronic computers of the kind we now routinely have basically came into existence after World War II. Uh, ENIAC, for example, first big, big one in the US was like 1946. Um, it was, and, and so what did computer mean before that time? Well, first thing is that more common than computer with an ER was compute or with an OR, a person who would compute things. And that was a serious and important profession was just being able to compute things. And so there were many places where uh, computing of that type was important. So, um, uh, for example, ballistics tables. Um, I think the ENIAC was originally developed in connection with the Aberdeen Proving Ground, um, and uh, uh, which is a ballistics um, uh, question of ballistics. So, I mean, the, the basic issue is you're going to shoot a shell you know, 10 miles or something from a very big gun, and it's going to go in a roughly parabolic trajectory, but exactly where is it gonna land uh, when you take into account air resistance, wind, uh, the rotation of the earth, all these kinds of things. Um, that turns out to be a problem that is hard to compute and for which there was a great desire to have uh, more efficient methods of computation. I mean, people typically use tables that have been pre-computed to do those ballistics computations um, before there were electronic computers to do them. And uh, the, the first computers of that type were developed to produce the tables. But let me go back a little bit in history. Um, so uh, mechanical computers had existed uh, from, well, the earliest example we know is the Antikythera device from around first century BC to first century AD. But it's, a, it's an outlier. It's the only one of those we know in antiquity. Um, the uh, kind of mechanical computers, which are essentially like odometer-like wheels that you could use for addition or multiplication uh, and so on, those started to be developed in the mid 1600s. Um, so 1640-ish uh, Pascal, um, famously had an early such thing. I think it was a chap called Chicard, who's the earliest known example uh, as a person who interacted with Kepler and built, I think it was a wooden device, which has not survived. The Pascal device is, is made of metal and did survive. And a lot of other people got into the act, you know, Gottfried Leibniz, for example, late 1600s, uh, spent 30 years trying to, uh, to perfect kind of a four function uh, plus minus times divides uh, kind of, uh, you know, mechanical computer made of brass. You can actually see the thing that he, he made um, uh, in his archive in Hanover. Um, but uh, uh, there was sort of steady improvement of mechanical computers. And when I was a kid, for example, uh, mechanical computers were still a thing. You know, electronic calculators came in around 1972. And before that time, there were, uh, you know, if you were, sort of a sophisticated, you got to use, um, uh, if you were very sophisticated, you got to use electronic computers, uh, big electronic computers. But if you were a little bit like a, 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 a sort of a, an advanced kid, so to speak, you might use, or, or somebody in, a, in, a, in an office or something, you might very well use a mechanical calculator um, and uh, where you were, you know, turning a wheel and you were setting things and, and um, uh, you were setting essentially cogs and then turning things and, and numbers were popping out and so on. Um, 
that was kind of mechanical calculators was kind of the, the state of the art um, up until, well, big computers came in in the 1950s to 1960s. Calculators came in in the beginning of the 1970s, 1972 or so. Uh, personal computers came in in the beginning of the 80s. Um, so for uh, you know, the earlier version of computers, um, people were at best using mechanical calculators, which at best could do plus minus times divides. Now, the other standard method of computation was slide rules. Um, I think I have a slide rule someplace about it. I don't know. I can't get it right now. But, but um, slide rules were invented um, back in the 1600s, um, along with the invention of logarithms. Um, I think they were invented, uh, a chap called William Outred, who was a, um, also the person who invented the multiplication sign, uh, which famously Leibniz said was a really bad idea because it looks like an X and people are going to get it confused. But um, anyway, it survived anyway. But a slide rule, again, when I was a kid, that was the standard way that you computed. If you didn't have this sort of big mechanical metal calculator, the, the next best thing was a slide rule where you're using logarithmic, uh, using the fact that logarithms, when you add logarithms, that corresponds to multiplication, to be able to do multiplication and division and a fancy slide rule would have many different scales. You know, there was a C scale and a D scale, which were the main two scales used for multiplication. Um, and then there were all kinds of other scales that would have trigonometric functions and um, sometimes other quite different kinds of computations encoded in those slide rule scales. And I think a, a sort of typical somewhat fancy slide rule might have had, uh, I don't know, 10 scales on the front and 10 scales on the back. Um, so anyway, that was kind of the state of the art for calculating things. Uh, it's kind of the hierarchy of either you did it by pure pencil and paper, or you're using a slide rule, or you're using a mechanical calculator. Um, and in World War II, that was the state of the art. And um, you would, uh, so uh, ballistics tables were one place where computations were done. Um, the nuclear weapons development, the Manhattan Project was another big place where they were done. Another place where they were done was some aerodynamics calculations. I think famously the wings of the Spitfire fighter were, defi were, were designed um, using an early version of the finite, finite difference method for solving uh, partial differential equations. Um, actually, no, a relaxation method for doing that um, because you essentially were solving, I think that was a, essentially solving Laplace's equation numerically. Um, but in any case, the, the, um, uh, in, for example, the Manhattan Project, uh, there was a whole, group of people who were computers who were uh, working out different kinds of things. And actually my, my friend Dick Feynman, uh, former friend Dick Feynman, um, who uh, was uh, his, his job at Los Alamos, one of his main jobs was running, uh, I'm not sure if the whole or part of the, of the pool of computers um, who were doing those kinds of uh, uh, calculations. And people developed, uh, I, I would say that the, um, um, in those days, the computers uh, were mostly women, um, mostly, uh, um, and, uh, and that, that actually continued when the first programmers um, were um, originally programming electronic computers. It was, it was primarily a, a uh, uh, it was very much weighted in, in the, in, in the, 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 the female direction and um, something that we're finally seeing come back with the, the, the current generation of, of, um, uh, of programmers, I think, but it's taken a long time. But in any case, the, um, uh, the thing that um, um, was, uh, so, so you ask about computers in World War II, um, the, the dominant form of computation were these uh, were these non-digital electronic computer type methods. Now, in terms of what was being developed during World War II, there's sort of a certain amount of some things that are a bit shrouded in mystery, um, but there are a few things one knows. One certainly knows about the development of um, essentially electromechanical computers at Bletchley Park in England for code breaking. 
And the problem there was that one needed to, uh, in order to break those codes, one had to evaluate many different possible passwords, many different possible keys. And the question was, how quickly could you check whether these keys were plausible? And by plausible, one meant, did they uh, sort of uh, decode a message into good German or would they decode a message with that key into garbled letters that couldn't possibly have been an original message? And so there was this computer called the BOMB, B-O-M-B-E, that was developed at Bletchley Park. It's a kind of special purpose computer whose objective was to just step through different possible keys and see which ones worked. And that computer was very much based on uh, telephone switching technology. Uh, that had been another kind of branch. This is a complicated history, actually. The, um, um, in the development of computers, okay, I, I should explain a little bit of, of, the, of the history. There were mechanical computers and there was sort of a, a, a push to think about, could we automate the operation of a mechanical computer, of a, of a mathematical calculation mechanical computer? Could we make that electronic? That was what led eventually to the ENIAC. Um, the, uh, there was sort of a big innovation, which was the stored program computer, where instead of just having to set up with kind of a plug board of wires or, or some other method, um, set up in hardware what computation one wanted to do, it was possible to in effectively store in the memory of the computer um, a specification of the program and then execute it. And that was the thing that, that um, uh, came in. And there was a chap called John Atanasoff, who was a physicist in Iowa, who was um, uh, involved in what, what may have been the, sort of the first stored program computer um, around the, around maybe the uh, 1940-ish, maybe that kind of time frame. Um, it's always confusing because I grew up in England where the, the dates of World War II are 1939 to 1945. Um, in the US, they're obviously different. Um, 1942, I guess, to 1945. Um, so when people say during World War II, they, um, the dates are, um, uh, uh, they're, they're different dates that one thinks of. In any case, the, um, so one branch of the development of computers had to do with let's, let's automate the mechanical calculators, so to speak. Another branch of um, uh, computing had to do with the computers that were used for uh, for example, um, cryptography, cryptanalysis, like the bombs at Bletchley Park, which were a little bit more special purpose. They were not intended to automate mathematical calculation. They were intended to automate this process of stepping through these different possible keys. And as I say, they were using technology that had been developed for the uh, electronic switching system for telephones, where you know, back when telephones were first around, you know, 120 years ago or something now, um, they um, uh, that was the thing where where um, um, the it's, it's um, ringing in the background. It's very curious. Um, okay, the um, presumably stop. It doesn't stop. It, it, um, um, well, gosh, if it really doesn't stop, I suppose I can stop it. No, it stopped. Um, in any case, the, um, uh, uh, what was I saying? I was saying that, that um, uh, back when, when telephones were first around, you would pick up your phone and you would get, uh, it was sort of a direct electrical connection to the operator who would then take sort of the wire that was coming from your phone and, and have a plug board where they would connect one wire to another, uh, to another, you know, your, your output to another input. And that's the way that you would be connected to another uh, person, so to speak. And then when people started having long distance phone calls and things, it became quite unrealistic to have somebody just sort of plug these together. And so, I don't actually know the, the whole history of this, but, but um, I guess it was called STD, Standard Trunk Dialing. And I think trunk dialing had to do with the idea that you would have these trunks, which were collections of wires, uh, 
that and you would be able to do things where you would instead of just saying i want to directly connect to my friend jim or something who's at this number that the you know where one wire could connect to another wire you were connecting into a trunk which would then go to another uh, another exchange uh, where there will be another connection made and so on. It, it kind of, I think, is reminiscent of the early days of, of email, for example. You know, in today's world, and you would just say, you know, uh, whatever, at something at Wolfen.com or something as, a, as, a, as an email address. But back when email was, was young, uh, the, um, back in, even in the, in the, well, in the 80s, when I, when I used email, um, the UUCP, the Unix to Unix copy system, was kind of a, a, a main way of doing email. It wasn't the only way, but it was a, a, a main way, a, an important way of doing email. And what you would do there is you would say literally the route of the email should follow. You'd say one machine, X time, another machine, X time, another machine. And it would be like one machine would call the next machine, would call the next machine, and so on, going down the line. And I think that's more what was happening with this kind of exchange to exchange type of thing. But anyway, that, that whole mechanism of getting sort of automated dialing, of uh, automation of dialing led to a kind of automation, which is what was used for, for example, the bomb computers in, um, or I'm not sure when we really call them a computer, they're very special purpose kind of computers. Now, uh, in uh, one thing that's missing from my story here is well, what about all the theoretical work that was done, like Alan Turing's 1936, paper on universal computers or Emil Post's work on, on string manipulation systems or Alonzo Church's Lambda Calculus uh, or Moses Schoenfinkel's Combinators back from 1920. Uh, what happened to those things? How did they relate to the actual computers that were being built? The answer is they didn't really relate. Um, one could have imagined computers that were based on string manipulation, maybe even an explicit implementation of a Turing machine, but that isn't what people built. What people built was much more in the line of sort of automate the mechanical calculators. And it took kind of a, the, the kind of work on neural nets by McCulloch and Pitts in the 1943 or so. Um, and then John von Neumann kind of being interested both in brains and in computing machines to kind of bring together the tradition of sort of Turing machines and theoretical computation together with a sort of practical, let's actually have an adder and a multiplier built into our computer um, kind of computation. So uh, those, uh, there were actually early proposals. I, I recently learned that Haskell Curry, who was the person who really, uh, well, spent, spent a career working on combinators, these very simple bases for computation that Moses Schoenfinkel had invented in 1920, but people hadn't really understood very well then and pretty much ever since. I wrote a, a book about those things actually in, in, uh, in 2020 in sort of celebration of the 1920 uh, uh, invention of those things. And there's lots more one could say about them today, but there's no question that they are uh, very abstract and in many ways very obscure and not a good sort of human way to present computation. But in any case, uh, Curry's work on combinators led him among other things to start suggesting, I gather, functional programming kinds of ideas very early on in, in, the, in the days when the ENIAC was being developed. It's not clear people understood. It's not completely clear he completely understood uh, some of what can now be done in those directions. And of course, Lambda calculus have been invented in 1935 that's sort of a, a fundamental thing used in, uh, in functional programming, but that didn't enter kind of the world of practical programming for a very long time. That was very much a theoretical kind of thing. Now, there's one additional piece to this whole picture uh, that people sometimes bring up. Um, there are sort of where else were computers invented? There's a chap called Konrad Zuza, who um, uh, did work on computers uh, presumably during World War II, and, and then subsequently had a company in Germany called Zusa AG that uh, made computers. And um, uh, was, uh, and that I think stayed in existence certainly through the 1970s. Uh, Konrad Zusa uh, was kind of a, a um, uh, I would say, a, um, not only a practical build computers kind of person, but also a, um, uh, what's kind of the, 
the theory of what one can do with computation, a little bit at least. Um, and he got interested in whether one could sort of have physics be ultimately computational. And I actually exchanged letters with him in the early 1980s because he'd gotten interested in the things I'd done about cellular automata and so on. He had a kind of a model in which space was divided into discrete cells and somehow at every cell there would be a number. And it's very much more like a finite difference kind of uh, different uh, version of differential equations than a, a true cellular automaton where you're forcing yourself to have a discrete value at every cell as well as to have discrete cells. But in any case, he was interested in those kinds of things. But there's, a, there's an interesting piece to this tale. Uh, in 1944 or so, uh, Konrad Zuse, uh apparently developed a, a binary mechanical computer. Um, and uh, perhaps the first kind of um, uh, binary computer that had been produced. But it's a, it's a very interesting and tangled tale what the real story of that computer was. Um, and I, I've tried a little bit to track this down. It's a little bit mired in kind of national pride. I mean, it's like when I was a kid and you said, where, were, when was, where was television invented? I always learned the television was invented by a Scottish chap called Baird. Um, but I think in the US, one learns that it was invented by an American. I think in Russia, one learns it was invented by a Russian, in France, by a French person, and so on. Um, so I think that um, there is a certain, uh, when it comes to computers, there can be also a certain national pride factor um, because the, the true, quotes invention of the computer was a somewhat long drawn out kind of thing. It wasn't like a particular moment when sort of everything that we think of as a modern computer was invented. But anyway, one of the sort of pieces of that uh, was this work done by Conrad Zuza. And I'll tell you what I, what I think I know about this. I mean, there were um, a collection of um, computers um, produced by, uh, I say computer, it's a mechanical calculating device. Um, that happened to use binary. Um, and uh, uh, there is, in, at least there was, oh, maybe close to 10 years ago now, there at least was a reproduction of this computer in a museum in Berlin. And um, uh, I remember I visited there once and, and I actually met with both the, the curator who'd been responsible for this and Konrad Zuse's son, Horst Zusa, um, and uh, the you know there's this computer and it was reconstructed by Horst Zusa and Konrad Zusa, you know many many years after the computer had originally existed, and it, it's there in the museum or it was there in the museum, and it's like how do you know what the computer was like, and the answer was there was one photograph of the computer, and um, that was apparently taken in 1944 or so. Um, and uh, the computer in the photograph actually didn't look much like the computer that was in the museum, but sort of it was, it had been sort of flattened out and turned around and so on. So perhaps it was the same kind of, kind of structure, uh, but I think some of it may have been kind of uh, almost by memory 30 years later. So I'm not sure how, how reliable that will have been. But the real question that I had was, this is a computer made of metal. What happened to it? It was, you know, you can't just, you know, it's a big object made of metal, um, uh, steel, actually. What, um, what became of the computer? Well, what I had heard was that the computer had been in a house, the, the house of Konrad Zuse's parents in Berlin, and that the house was bombed in, in World War II, and the computer was destroyed. But so then I, I was like, but, but, you know, a house is bombed, what actually happens to a computer, a big hunk of metal in a, in a house that's bombed? And um, the, the answer seemed quite obscure because it was like, well, where was the computer? Was the computer you know, on the third floor of the house? Was it in the basement of the house? Uh, what happens to a big chunk of steel if a house collapses on top of it? You know, what, what was the whole story? And, and the question that I asked right there was, where is this house? Well, the answer is it was about five blocks from there. Unfortunately, I had to go catch a plane, but I could have uh, investigated even at the time. 
but it was uh, about five blocks from there or something. And it was just on the Western side of where the Berlin Wall had been um, in an area that had been rather a, a kind of dumpy area, but had been um, coming up in the world um, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. But in any case, the, the question then was, well, okay, what happens to a computer that is, you know, where was the computer in the house? Well, it was thought to have been in the basement. Okay, if it's in the basement, a house maybe collapses on top of it. Uh, but that means it's sort of an archeology span problem. And so I subsequently asked some people I know who've done urban archeology, span um, what, what would you find? What would happen in this case? And they were like, well, it'll be there. You know, something will be there. It may have been squashed and crushed and things, but it'll be there. Um, and uh, if it, it and and so then, as a question of okay, uh, the 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 people who I asked about urban archaeology did say urban archaeology is a complicated thing to do because there are all kinds of permits and ownership questions, and they said often the people don't want you to find the stuff that you would find with urban archaeology, and. Um, so I, over, the, over the years, I've, I've occasionally made inquiries about the Zusa computer and what really happened to it. And, and it kind of, uh, you know, at first it was like it was in this house. Someone knows the address of the house. Actually, it was two houses next to each other. And in Germany, uh, the, the property records are not public. So it's not easy to just sort of look up what the, what the ownership history of that house has been. Um, but uh, then, then it was like, well, well let's you know, we did find out something about this house and then, well, actually maybe it isn't in the house, maybe it's in this, underneath this park that's next to the house. And then, well, actually maybe it was an air raid shelter that was somewhere different that had been moved to. And somehow the computer has been on the move, but it's never been found. And, and I have to say, I think it would be very interesting to find this computer. I do think that there are questions about uh, both well, there are questions about what one would find if one found the computer. For example, it's not obvious uh, where, uh, how you get big hunks of metal during World War II in, you know, late in World War II in Berlin. Um, and there's sort of probably a, a complicated tale of where that metal came from and sort of how militarily related the computer really was. I mean, the original claim had been that uh, Zuza was a, uh, just a student and just building this computer for fun. People have told me, series of different people have told me all kinds of tales. I'm afraid not, the tales don't completely fit together. So I'm not sure they're worth repeating because they don't really, um, uh, the, the, they don't really um, uh, sort of connect um, the, uh, about um, so the relationship of Zuza to the um, uh, German Air Force particularly and um, other parts of the German sort of state apparatus at that time. But anyway, so that's a, that's a mystery out there. That's a sort of uh, history of computing mystery that's still out there. It probably will eventually be resolved. I'm afraid um, uh, there are still people around. Um, I talked to one chap in his 90s who had been, uh, who, uh, had been a, a user of the Zusa computers and so on, um, the electronic ones that have been produced after World War II. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, I'm afraid it's, you know, time is sort of running out in terms of people who had first time knowledge of some of these things. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, there's still the archaeology when that fails. Okay, let's see. Um, that was a very long answer, sorry, to, to that question. Um, so questions, oh, okay, all sorts of interesting things. Um, Parmenides comments that Imitation Game is a, is a great movie about computers in World War II. I have to say that that movie uh, frustrated me because it's a really good movie as a movie and it's a really inaccurate rendering of the history. It's a movie that purports to be about Alan Turing uh, and his adventures at Bletchley Park during World War II. And it has some beautiful reproductions of things like the bomb computers at Bletchley Park and kind of great set design and so on but the actual screenplay is, paints a, a, a picture of, of Alan Turing that is completely inaccurate, so far as I can tell. I mean, it paints a picture of a kind of confident, arrogant um, uh, uh, sort of chap who, and that's not what people who knew Alan Turing uh, 
have told me he was like at all. Um, and uh, much more nerdy, much more kind of um, uh, very, very different from the way it's portrayed in that movie. So uh, it was kind of interesting because the, at about the same time, a few years ago, the Imitation Game movie came out and, um, oh gosh, what was it called? A movie about Stephen Hawking. Um, oh, what was it called? Maybe Theory of Everything? I'm not sure. Um, came out and uh, I would say as, you know, pure movie critic, movie making, the Imitation Game movie about, about Alan Turing was a more uh, sort of more, a better movie as movie, um, but the, the Stephen Hawking movie was a vastly more accurate movie. I mean, I had in fact known Stephen Hawking at roughly the, the more or less the time period, a little bit after the time period that that movie uh, was, was covering. And uh, it seemed pretty accurate and pretty good um, rendering of, um, and, and actually I had known um, uh, there were all sorts of physicists and things portrayed in that movie, most of whom I, I, I knew or had, or had known and I would say that that movie, from what I know, was a pretty accurate movie, but less, less good entertainment value, so to speak, than the imitation game. Um, so it goes. I mean, this is, this is one of the uh, sort of trade-offs of, um, uh, of movies. I, in the times I've helped with, with movies and things, and you, know, you try and inject some science or historical accuracy or something, and, um, but you have to be aware of the fact that the arc of the story as far as the making of an entertaining movie, it's probably more important than the accuracy of, uh, you know, is that exactly the right thing to say scientifically or whatever else. Um, there's a question here on, um, uh, from Philip. How important are Nobel Prizes? Are there any scandalous omissions? You know, one thing I say about prizes in general is by the time a field has a prize for it, the field is already sufficiently well developed that the most exciting things have already been done. Not quite true, but it's often true. I mean, in, in, in things that, um, uh, for example, I've been involved in inventing, you know, eventually they're sort of prizes for those kinds of fields, but that's the time when the field is very well developed when it's just being invented. Nobody has a prize for a field that doesn't even have a name yet. So in the Nobel Prize, I would say that um, uh, it's, a, it's a funny thing because it is a, at the time when the prize was introduced by Alfred Nobel, um, inventor of dynamite, if I remember correctly, um, the, um, the prize was notable for being more money than anybody had ever seen a prize be. Um, so it was immediately kind of very famous in the world. And, and I know it had a lot of sort of special treatment. Like I, I remember the, the US tax code used to have an ex special exception for Nobel prizes not being taxable. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether that's still there because I, I remember commenting on that to a friend of mine who just won a Nobel prize maybe 15 years ago or something. And I'm not sure that clause was still there even at that time, but it had been there. Um, certainly was there 30 years ago. Um, so it was you know, considered to be a very sort of special prize. And um, because of the amount of money involved, there were subsequently other kinds of prizes which people, which are not nearly as sort of famous in popular culture, but which end up being at least as much money. And I think the uh, originally, there are lots of scurrilous things said about the original development of the Nobel Prize and, and kind of uh, sort of Alfred Nobel and, uh, you know, prizes. Prizes, one has to realize as a practical matter, are often as much uh, for the benefit of the giver as they are for the uh, benefit of the recipient, so to speak. And I think this was sort of a PR-induced um, uh, prize idea. And uh, the, the original Nobel Prizes are, are sort of Sweden-based, and then there are extra ones like the Peace Prize and so on, which are, and the Economics Prize, which I think are Norway-based, if I'm remembering correctly. But the original ones, the original Alfred Nobel ones, uh, sort of physics, chemistry, physiology, medicine, uh, am I forgetting one? I think that's it. Uh, notably, there isn't a mathematics one. The, um, the gossip claim is that um, a chap called Gustav Mittag Mittag Leffler, uh, 
who was a famous um, Swedish mathematician, um, had some romantic involvement with Nobel's wife. Again, this is this is gossip. I don't. I have not gone and tracked down the history of this well. And that um, Nobel was kind of like, I'm not going to give a prize for mathematics, um, you know, because that scoundrel Metagliflo will will inevitably win it. And so, so that's why there was sort of no Nobel Prize for, for mathematics. Um, so, the, so the gossip goes. Uh, you know, I think in the early years of Nobel Prizes, there was some uh, kind of, well, there was a sort of golden, okay, physics was in exactly the state that I might describe it of being a sort of well-developed field where, well, there was incremental progress, but but you know nothing too dramatic was happening um, right around the time when the Nobel Prize was was introduced. But then, uh, sort of, you know, the kind of golden age of relativity and quantum mechanics and so on started developing, and suddenly physics was very exciting. And so there are uh, plenty of sort of famous Nobel prizes. I mean, I think there were some early Nobel prizes. There was one given for some kind of lighthouse invention that was. Um, uh, where it's like you know, they've kind of run out of things to, you know, dramatic developments in physics by the time that's what this physics prize is, is going to. But then physics woke up again. And so the Nobel Prize ended up being something that made, made some more sense for, for a number of years. And, you know, I think that it is interesting because there's sort of a... Um, uh, uh, a the there's sort of theoretical Nobel Prizes for theoretical developments, and then there are practical ones. And for a while, it was like there were whole there was a whole series like everybody who'd invented a kind of particle detector eventually won a Nobel Prize, so to speak, where they were kind of methodological prizes or or instrumentation prizes more so than sort of uh, conceptual prizes or theoretical prizes. And I think there was long kind of a a belief well. You know, it can't really be a pure theoretical prize. It's got to be sort of something where uh, the thing was sort of reduced to practice and somebody actually observed that effect and so on. You know, in the early days of the Nobel Prize and the, the sort of theory versus other things, it's often quoted that, you know, when Einstein won his uh, sort of very much expected Nobel Prize, it was for the photoelectric effect, not for relativity, because at the time relativity was still sort of theoretical and controversial, and the photoelectric effect was something you'd go out and measure and see that yes, that was it really worked that way, so to speak. Um, I think that uh, in I must admit that with some exceptions, I have uh, the you know as as different fields have gone up and down in in energy level, so to speak. The prizes have been more and less interesting. I mean, even in physics, for example, it's I was uh, it's always a bit funny when I when I see the you know the latest Nobel Prize announcement. I've never heard of the people who are winning it, and I really do follow physics and have done for many many years. But it's you know that's often for things like instrumentation, which is something I don't follow as such, and where often the names of the people are not as widely known as the, as the instruments they've created and so on. Um, in, you know, in recent years, sort of biology has been a big kind of area because it's a very hot field. You know, and there have been things in physics like the gravitational wave discovery, which was a real sort of uh, you know, old style Nobel Prize type story, so to speak. Um, I think the, uh, there's also the question of, you know, what does it do to a field when there's a prize that people think is really worth winning? Um, and I'm not sure how, uh, when I was doing physics in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, it was kind of like people would always say, oh, well, if you do that, you know, you'll eventually win a Nobel Prize type thing. And that's, you know, then you've really made it kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure that that's a great feature for a field. I've certainly seen people, uh, for whom that's been a very negative thing. You know, I'm reminded, I haven't thought about this for ages. I remember when I was a kid and it must have been, oh, when was it? Probably early 1970s, because I remember it was on a uh, yeah, black and white television. I remember seeing some, some movie type thing 
whose title was How to Win a Nobel Prize. I'm, I'm sure in the modern days, one could just look it up and it's somewhere on YouTube. But I remember it, it had, it was kind of funny. It had a, it was a, um, uh, you know, the fact that it was being broadcast on British television tells one, I don't know what it tells one, but um, uh, a, a different, perhaps a different kind of programming than, than one would normally find today. But um, it was, uh, uh, it had sort of these amusing little, little segments and it had sort of a card that came up at the end of each segment. And, and one of the cards was don't die um, or don't die too quickly because, you know, it pointed out, you know, the, the average time from a discovery being made to the, you know, prize being given. I don't remember at all what the, what the answer was, but, you know, 30 years or something like this. And it, it had, um, I think it had other ones. It was like, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's been a long time. There was probably a, a don't nominate yourself and there's a, um, uh, there, there were some other ones which were kind of um, uh, a little bit more hard to arrange, so to speak, um, uh, kinds, of, uh, kinds of concepts. But the, the don't die one is one that um, I sort of remember as a, as a, um, as a conclusion there. Um, and that's sort of, you know, that there's been a certain sense of, of some kinds of, uh, there's been a certain, oh, you know, that thing happened, but that was 40 years ago. And oh, they're just around getting around to giving the prize. Now that's old hat type thing. So, but in any case, in terms of the, the dynamics of a field where the Nobel Prize is like a, a, an important thing, which I, I think it is more important in some places than in others. Um, I think that uh, uh, somehow in, um, in economics, it's almost like every, any economist I've ever heard of has got a Nobel Prize at some time or another. And um, uh, it's, um, uh, and that, I don't know what, what, you know, there's probably some dynamics that have to do with the different sizes of fields and things like this. But um, in, in physics, where I know it in a bit more detail, uh, there are, I would say there's the, the sort of the worst case is people who made a discovery, which they were like, well, this should win a Nobel Prize. And then they waited for years and decades. And eventually they got the Nobel Prize, at least in one case that I'm thinking of in particular. And um, I, I, it seemed like a whole lifetime was spent waiting for a Nobel Prize. Um, in the end, um, the person uh, involved was a friend of mine. Um, it's, uh, um, the, um, uh, you know, in the end, I happened to drop in on him and on his office shelf was this box of sort of Nobel stuff, a cardboard box. And I was like, well, did it actually turn out to be exciting? And he was like, no, not really. It was kind of, you know, the parties were kind of fun, but it wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't that exciting type thing. Um, I think that the, um, uh, you know, there have been other cases, um, oh, for example, um, cases where there have been endless sort of uh, maneuvering for, you know, who will get the prize for what? I mean, I certainly, I know plenty of cases where people spent, you know, ages doing sort of scientific politicking of, uh, uh, you know, always mention me in connection with this so that um, I'm part of the story of the prize. I'm, I'm thinking of at least uh, three major examples of that. Um, and, and then there were cases, uh, you know, one I could mention was um, Benoit Mandelbrot, the um, inventor of fractals and so on, who was quite obsessed with the idea that he should win some Nobel Prize, whichever one was available, so to speak. So first it was the physics prize, then he kind of segued to kind of going for the economics prize. And maybe there was even a chemistry play in the middle of that. And I remember actually, now that I'm thinking about it, back in 1984, I was at a a conference that was put on by the Nobel Foundation um, uh, uh, that was, uh, I don't think it had anything to do with the Nobel Prize. I just think it happened to be the same foundation that was putting it on, um, although probably a bunch of the people, in fact, yeah, I, I remember talking to some of the people who were there who were part of the you know, Swedish Academy of Sciences and, and part of the sort of Nobel Prize apparatus, but this particular conference had no particular Nobel Prize character to it, so to speak. Um, but anyway, I was there and Benoit Mandelbrot was also there and I was young in those days. Um, Benoit was not quite so young, um, but Benoit was like, you know, at every possible opportunity was kind of um, uh, 
uh, sort of um, canvassing for a physics Nobel Prize. And I was like, Benoit, why do you care? You know, it's like, like nobody, you know, fractals are important and they will be remembered and nobody will know or care whether the person who invented them won a Nobel Prize or didn't. It's the, the prize pales in comparison to the actual discovery. And that's, that's usually the case for, for significant discoveries. And I think, um, but, you know, for, but I think, I mean, my, my own feeling is that prizes are a complicated piece of tactics for a field. Uh, as I say, prizes are often, as a practical matter, much more for the benefit of the giver than for the benefit of the recipient. Um, and, uh, but even if you sort of uh, consider the cases where prizes have been set up for the purpose of guiding a field, it's a complicated issue. I mean, I have set up a few prizes myself for specific problems and projects that I'd like to see solved. And, and one in particular, the two, three Turing machine prize from 2007, that was a big success because uh, a young chap called Alex Smith, um, you know, I put up the prize and four months later, he'd solved it. I have another one for rule 30, various features of rule 30 that we put up in 2018 or 2019, which uh, is still very much open. And another one for S combinator universality that was from uh, 2020 or 2021 actually. Um, and uh, that um, I'm a little bit afraid that those prizes will remain open for hundreds of years. Um, and uh, uh, that's always a risk, but at least they're very specific kinds of things aimed to kind of highlight the, the value I believe of solving particular kinds of scientific problems, uh, rather than kind of more of a, um, uh, an after the fact, kind of uh, that was cool type thing. Um, so, uh, the, um, okay, I see somebody um, apparently said that, that the Nobel Prize is taxable income now. It definitely wasn't, because I remember seeing that very line when I first moved to the US, I remember seeing that very line on the tax returns. Um, and uh, uh, certainly by the rules as I understand them today would be taxable income. I remember that in the, um, uh, when I got one of these MacArthur Fellowship things in 1981, uh, that was a time when it was still the case that if somebody just gave you a, a thing, gave you money and you didn't have to do anything for it, then that still didn't count as something taxable. And I, but that loophole was subsequently, uh, subsequently removed, uh, at least largely so. Um, the, uh, yeah, Philip is commenting that some Nobel Prizes have been a bit random. Penzias and Wilson, this, this has um, got the prize for discovering the cosmic microwave background, but George Gamow, who predicted it, um, got nothing. I, was Gamow still alive? And so the, the cosmic microwave background was discovered around 1964. Um, and as sort of a, a um, uh, it was kind of a, um, a chance discovery because these folks at Bell Labs, um, and uh, I certainly uh, met Arno Penzias, um, uh, who was, uh, became a sort of senior manager at Bell Labs, uh, Subsequently, um, the, um, uh, they were trying to do early satellite communications because there were now satellites by 1964 or so. And um, the, uh, they wanted to set up an antenna that would be a very high gain antenna that would be um, uh, uh, picking up, you know, even very small satellite signals. And they discovered that they just kept on seeing noise in this, um, their antenna kept on, um, picking up uh, radio noise. And um, uh, that was, um, it was eventually realized that there was this 2.7 Kelvin background radiation that was being, being detected there. Um, but, um, and then it was rather quickly figured out. In, in those days, people weren't sure about the early, the, the origins of the universe. And there were really two competing theories, the, the big bang theory that said it all started from a, a, a small sort of hot thing and then expanded outward and the steady state theory that said that gradually new matter was coming to, into existence 
the universe was expanding by virtue of new matter kind of popping into existence in different places around the universe. And Fred Hoyle in particular was very much a, who was a, a British um, cosmologist, who I unfortunately never met, um, the, uh, who um, uh, was very, was sort of the, the ascendant figure hit there. And he had um, said, it's uh, the steady state theory is the thing. And in fact, I think he coined the term Big Bang as a kind of put down to this alternative theory that it all started in, in a Big Bang, so to speak. But I think it was very, very quick when the cosmic microwave background um, was, uh, or what was originally called the microwave background radiation um, was, uh, was discovered. I think it was surprisingly quick that people realized that that was probably leftover radiation from the Big Bang. Um, uh, and that had been a thing that um, George Gamow, who'd been a nuclear physicist, uh, had um, sort of predicted. He was um, involved in early ideas about um, the production of, um, of elements in the early universe through nuclear reactions and so on. Um, and uh, I think um, um, uh, I, I never met George Gamow. I'm not even sure um, how long he lived. I think he was at the University of Colorado in the end. Um, he was famous for such little gags as um, uh, there's a theory to do with nuclear alpha decay. And um, there was a paper by a person called Alpha, P-H-E-R, um, Beta, Hans Beta, B-E-T-H-E, and Gamow, G-A-M-O-W, and um, that was, they were, you know, I think, I think they, they may have even added an author to that paper just to make it the alpha, beta, gamma uh, type, type paper. I think Gamow was then involved in lots of other kind of exported physics kinds of ideas, um, including questions about the genetic code and things like that, which I think didn't work out perfectly in the end. Um, he also wrote a number of uh, fun, popular books about relativity and Another thing, I think he, I think he wrote an autobiography called something like um, "My World Line," uh, playing on the kind of relativity uh, uh, notion of of that, if I'm remembering correctly. In any case, um, yeah. Well, so the it's um, uh, on the yeah. One of the things that um, um, people you know, depending on how you define sort of the, the, the prize domain, so to speak, people regularly send me things saying, you know, look, the instrumentation that you've produced for physics, namely Mathematica and so on, is, you know, has been a really important thing in, in the history of physics. And it's like, but I certainly wouldn't, you know, it's like from my point of view of the definition of sort of physics prizes, uh, you know, this is tooling, so to speak, but I guess it's, it's no more or less tooling than something like a bubble chamber. Um, let's see. Um, there's a question here about, from Diana, about uh, when and why did apprenticeships end? Seems like lots of great people were apprentices. Um, and she mentions Benjamin Franklin, I actually, Yes, I, I guess I did know that, that piece of the story. Apprenticeships, well, still exist in many, for many practical purposes, although they're not usually called apprenticeships. But the concept, I think, of apprenticeships was something that was really big when there were guilds and when there was this whole kind of hierarchy of, you know, first you joined a um, uh, some you know, blacksmith or something as an apprentice, and then you became, I'm not sure of the sequence, I think journeyman was one piece of it, and eventually you became a, a sort of full guild member blacksmith. And it was kind of a process of first you're kind of working with the person, and then you kind of gradually advance to the point where you can sort of take over their job. Well, for example, the way that a lot of academia works and this concept of kind of graduate students who will be the kind of um, the apprentices, so to speak, uh, to the, the professors 
it's not really quite defined that way and, the, and things worked a bit differently and the history of universities was a little bit different in terms of the way that was set up because universities didn't really, the concept of research as kind of a, a key mission of universities is a comparatively recent phenomenon in many ways. Um, I mean, in, in the earlier days of universities from the 1200s and so on, it was much more of a, a kind of professional uh, education often for the church, um, sometimes later on for medicine and things like this, um, but uh, law. And I think it was kind of much more of broadcast education, so to speak. The concept of research being rolled into that is a somewhat more recent phenomenon, but by the time that was being rolled in and the idea of PhDs and things like that, that's a, a you know, last, well, last hundred years, a bit more than that, but not much more than that. I mean, I, well, Actually, that's not quite right. There were even in the 1600s, people were getting, at least in continental Europe, people were getting doctorates. Um, I think that wasn't a phenomenon yet in, um, uh, in the UK, for example. But um, in any case, the, the, the whole idea that, that sort of the, that universities would be these places where, where research as well as sort of broadcast education happened, um, and then there would be people who would have students and those students are sort of apprenticed. That's, that's a thing very much like the traditional apprentice system. It is interesting that apprenticing has been less of a thing in some of the, well, and, and, and by the way, uh, for example, in medical education, um, that's again, uh, quite a, you know, it's not, not quite, configured as an individual apprentice to an individual doctor, but it's still the same kind of training type process. Um, the fact that that hasn't happened in some areas like programming is sort of interesting. It looked as if it was going to happen, and then it kind of didn't happen. In a sense, some of the things that we do, for example, with our summer school and other things like that, are sort of a, a version of a modern apprenticeship kind of thing. And, and I suppose to some extent internships, although the, the meaning of internships in the world is sort of gradually inflated in strange ways, but, but um, uh, the, um, uh, that's kind of another, another modern version of kind of the apprentice concept. So I, I think it's still kind of alive and well, but insofar as the guilds are not something one talks about a lot, it's, uh, uh, that doesn't have that same sort of uh, official status that it might have had in the past. Let's see, maybe one or two more things here. Um, well, there's a question from A here. What happened to the interdisciplinary science of the Renaissance? Um, do the efficiency gains of specialization outweigh the harms of institutional departmentalization? Um, well, you know, there's this whole sort of claim that there was a time at, at which you could know all science and that didn't last. And there was also the concept of a, a Renaissance person, uh, meaning a person with a, a broad range of knowledge of science and the arts and so on. Um, the idea that that could be done in the Renaissance and couldn't be done later is, is, a, is a sort of a common idea. You know, I think there's a couple of things to say. First of all, in any given time, in a given field, there's a certain, bowl, certain sort of corpus of knowledge and gradually more things get found out and there's sort of more pieces of knowledge that get filled in. But what tends to happen is there is also more principles and more abstraction that's, that's discovered. And so instead of having to know every individual piece of knowledge, you can just know the bigger principle and that's enough. You don't need to know all those specific facts once you know the, once the bigger principle is known and once you can learn the bigger principle. And so that's one reason why sort of the, the what there is to know hasn't just absurdly expanded beyond all possible bounds. And I think this question of whether people choose to know a broad range of things or specialize in particular things is as much as the question kind of indicated, an institutional question as an intellectual question. 
I mean, I know in my own case, I have tried to learn about lots of different kinds of things. Gosh, that, that might not be a surprise given these live streams that I'm trying to, trying to do here. Um, the, uh, uh, it's, um, and you know, one thing I can say about the process of doing that is the more you know, the easier it is to learn more stuff. Because the more you know, the more something new that comes in is fitted into sort of a matrix that you've already developed. And the less it's just like, oh, that's a random fact I have to remember from that field, uh, you know, doesn't fit into anything else. Um, I think that, uh, and I always find it difficult when I learn things that are far away from anything I already know, it's kind of like hard for me to remember and it's hard for me to kind of uh, internalize the, those things. So this question of, of sort of specialization and what that means. So you might think that to contribute to a field, you would have to be deeply and specializedly knowledgeable about that field. Um, and that that would be that the best way to kind of climb to the top of the tower of that field is to specialize in that field. Well, that is true if you want to make incremental progress in the field. If you want to actually make a foundational change in the field, it is absolutely not true. That is, it is uh, the most sort of foundational changes in fields do not come from adding another brick to the tower that's already been built in that field. They come from taking things that were not in that thing that was already built and wheeling in some new idea, possibly from some other field, possibly just a, an original idea that had not existed in any field, and using that to kind of uh, sort of foundationally push forward a given field. But it is certainly if you are trying to sort of have a, a, a thing where you have tens of thousands of scientists of a given type, then the structure will be such that you learn the tower, you can add another brick to the tower. That's a much more realistic thing for tens of thousands of people to meaningfully contribute to than to say, come in with these, you know, all these wild ideas from the outside. That's not a, an activity for tens of thousands of people. That's an activity for much smaller groups of people. But it's something where the, you might have thought that sort of increased specialization would lead to more rapid progress in fields. I think completely the opposite is true. That is two things happen. One, that once people kind of know so much within some field, they feel like that's the whole field. There's nothing else. There's, you know, there's so much that they've learned. There's a whole sort of room full of facts. And it's very hard to see beyond that because you're just saying, there's another fact. I know this from this area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, within this field. So it becomes sort of a, a, a claustrophobic experience of fact, so to speak, and much more difficult to kind of break out of that and see some, some more foundational kind of progress that can be made. That's one thing. The other thing is that institutionally, it tends to be the case that once you've got tens of thousands of people doing something and you've got hundreds of thousands, you've got professional societies, you've got funding agencies, you've got departments with management structures and all this, well, insofar as they have management structures, but with you know, tenure reviews and all this kind of thing, the, um, you, you've got a kind of a, an engine that's, that's running in a certain direction. And if you say, well, actually, there's this other direction over here that's really exciting and really innovative, the machine cannot go, it cannot turn itself to go in that direction. The machine already has all of its cogs and gears pointed in, in some other direction, um, in, in the one that had been developed over the course of however many decades, and it's going to keep going in that direction. It has huge inertia and huge resistance to change. So that's something that will happen when sort of when a science is kind of sufficiently successful that it gets institutionalized that way. It's kind of a thing where it's one of those be careful what you wish for kinds of things because it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's like sizes of companies and sizes of all kinds of things. The bigger it gets, the harder it is to turn. And the, um, and the more it's just gonna keep doing what it's doing for a hundred years or more, whatever it is, uh, even if that isn't in fact the, the thing that is going to ultimately lead to the most progress or the most interesting things happening. But you know, it becomes a thing where it is very much an occupation for people. And it's one where there are definite bounds and people kind of know what to expect. 
and that's an important thing for many people for for sort of for the parameters of an occupation and so that's what tends to happen but this question of whether things you know the renaissance was a period when all of this kind of um intellectual development and we can figure out new stuff and it isn't all written in the you know in the in aristotle or the bible type thing um you know we can figure out new stuff right here we can figure out new stuff when that was a new thing and hadn't been deeply institutionalized it was something where there was sort of much more flexibility and much more ability to to sort of be very innovative so to speak now there's something one needs to remember when one looks back at history is usually only the sensible and good stuff survives so you know if you look at the average book that was published in i don't know the early 1800s there was a lot of random fluff and crazy stuff and that's like you know this was a you know sort of poorly written irrelevant uninteresting book we never heard of it now and so we might think all the books from the early 1800s they were wonderful that was those were the days when people wrote good books but in fact it's a very biased kind of thing because it's only the good ones that anybody bothered to keep and and those are the things that we now think of from that time so i don't know to what extent the thinking that happened in the renaissance um was uh uh you know we know of leonardo da vinci we don't know of lots and lots of other people who maybe had all kinds of crazy ideas that uh just you know some of them perhaps should have survived um some of them kind of uh, they weren't that exciting um and uh, uh and 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 had we known about all of those we might have said well there was actually a lot of crazy stuff going on at that time and yeah there were a few few terrific people but most of it was kind of crazy stuff i i'm not sure about that um oh there's a question here from Parmenides, are crazy ideas useful to talk about or are they only good for guiding intuition and research? You know, I, I, that's, a, that's a pertinent point because I'm about to go to some meeting about what I think is in many ways a completely crazy idea. Um, why am I interested in it? Because it makes me think about a bunch of things. Even though it's an idea which I think is a, at a pragmatic level won't work, doesn't make any sense pragmatically, um it's still something that kind of loosens up the thinking process to say uh you know to kind of consider that crazy possibility and i think that um um the uh the thing that um um i've noticed you know in because i do a lot of uh, uh i'm often kind of trying to come up with brainstormed ideas about things and so on and in meetings with other people i have noticed that when somebody says well i have a crazy idea blank 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 that often ends up being the thing that becomes the winning idea and because it's kind of like by saying kind of i have a crazy idea it's kind of like the the loosening up of well i'm not don't have to follow in exactly the path we've been following in um which may have gotten us kind of stuck it's like there's this crazy thing to talk about now you know another thing to say about history of science and so on and, and crazy ideas is you know it's a weird thing that almost all of these kinds of uh, sort of vague thoughts about how things could work that people come up with and put in fiction and things like this a huge fraction of those things end up being things that at least have a relationship to something real in the end whether it's you know the star trek computer that we managed to build some version of in wolf alpha or whether it's some um, the uh oh i don't know some other or the little communicators that of course uh cell phones are very much like um or all sorts of other kinds of things where when there's a glimmer of an idea of how something might work uh it often ends up being real in the end or these concepts of uh uh well lots of kinds of things that 
might, we might now say that looks like a laptop computer. Well, the actual way things get implemented is often in detail different, and sometimes the emphasis is different, but you can often look back and say, this thing that people sort of were, were somewhat talking about is not such a crazy idea. I'll give you an example. In our, uh, so back in the 1800s, when people were thinking about electromagnetic waves, when Maxwell's equations from the 1860s, 1870s had predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves, which Hertz, for example, uh, observed, um, people wondered, well, how do electromagnetic waves work? Are they like sound waves? Do they propagate in something? And that was what led to the ether and the idea that, well, electromagnetic waves must propagate in the ether. And then in the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1900 or so, um, was like, no, there is no ether drift, there is no ether. And then relativity came in and kind of explained how things could work and Maxwell's equations could work out even without an ether. But so then the ether became, well, that was an idea that was sort of thrown in the garbage. Um, and sort of the notion of an ether is this notion there's something that sort of suffuses all of space that leads to things we observe. Well, guess what? The Higgs mechanism in the standard model is essentially an ether. And the cosmic microwave background defines a preferred reference frame for our universe. And we're moving at about a thousandth of the speed of light with respect to that. And in fact, in our models of physics, in a sense, everything is ether. The whole of space is what makes up everything in the universe. And space is this thing that has all of this activity in it. Um, and you could think of that a bit like an ether. Well, then, Given the idea of the ether, people had the idea, um, Maxwell talked about this, um, uh, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin talked about it. The idea maybe atoms, people were discovering different kinds of atoms in the late 1800s, maybe atoms are knots in the ether. And then even uh, Maxwell had a, a friend of his named Tate um, try and classify knots uh, because they thought, well, maybe just like there are about a hundred kinds of atoms, Maybe when we try and classify distinct knots, it'll turn out there's a hundred kinds of distinct knots. And then we'll understand how the, um, uh, how kind of, how there come to be these discrete kinds of atoms, which are knots in the ether and so on and so on and so on. And people say, nowadays they might say, well, that was a crazy idea, except it's not really that crazy an idea because it's coming back. In our model of physics, kind of particles are sort of some kind of topological uh, uh, topologically stable objects within this sort of quotes ether that is this kind of uh, complicated network that's kind of with lots of activity in it that represents space. So that idea that was sort of a glimmer of an idea back from the late 1800s is, you know, is very much back again. Same thing for, for, you know, many, many years, the idea that there were atoms, which had originated with people like um, Democritus and Leucippus and so on, that was kind of very much an out of favor idea. It took a couple thousand years uh, before that idea, which was kind of a possible idea about how things work, sort of came back. And um, I, I, I tend to think that there are very few ideas that have gotten good development and are actually completely worthless. Uh, you know, I've been interested in recent times in ideas that emerged in theology at the time before sort of science took over the kind of the, 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 the you know, the, the idea of progress, so to speak. There are questions about sort of why does the universe exist and, you know, why are there laws in the universe and so on, which were questions that have been, uh, you know, fairly deeply thought about in the context of theology. And, you know, I'm now back to thinking that some of those arguments are pretty interesting. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, there are, once an idea has gotten serious development, I tend to think that it's sort of worth considering for the future. Now, when there's something like, I just wonder if this could work like this, the crazy idea about, I just wonder if this could work like this. In my life, I've just seen so many of those things come into reality that I tend to think there aren't crazy ideas. Now, you know, there are things like, oh, I don't know, what's a good example of a crazy idea? Yeah, here's a good example. Brain-to-brain uh, -brain communication, extrasensory perception. That was a big thing when um, 
back in the 1960s and so on, 1950s, people were often talking about that. Could there be, you know, we communicate by talking to each other and, and hearing sound waves and so on. Could there be some direct, you know, brain to brain communication? People would have all these experiments where they put one person in one room and they would, you know, have what was it called remote seeing or something like that where you know, one person would show them a, a triangle and the other person would say, I'm, I'm thinking of a triangle type thing. You know, could that be, is that crazy? Is that not crazy? Well, we don't know yet. You know, it's something where you can say, oh no, that's impossible. Really? I doubt it's impossible. It's certainly the case we know that there are, for example, you know, the electrical activity in our brain produces some amount of, you know, it's mostly electrical activity we think we can pick up directly on the scalp, or if it's magnetic activity, we can pick it up a little bit further away. Um, we don't think that there are huge effects from that, but do we really know for sure? Do we know for sure that there aren't effects where there's some carefully tuned resonance of some molecule that will be a very sensitive receiver of essentially, you know, electromagnetic radiation produced by one brain? We don't know for sure. And to say, oh, that's just impossible and crazy is probably a mistake. To say, given a particular experiment, look, that experiment is no good and doesn't, doesn't show anything, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. Although even that is sometimes difficult. Um, boy, I'm really in a, a phone state here. Well, I think that's probably time for me to go. So, um, uh, one second here.